Yeah, welcome to the Community Information Session, 5th of September 2022. Um, my name is Michael Jackson, Clinical Health Educator, and this is on Insights on Post-Polio Exercise. This is based on a presentation I did at the Cairns Conference, which was about the 9th of June, I believe. Uh, we went up to Cairns, beautiful weather up there, um, and we had a one-day conference uh, with polio survivors, uh, many from Queensland, but a few from interstate joined us. So I'm going to go through uh, this set of about 24 slides, and then we'll have time to have some questions and answers and to discuss anything that um, I may come up. So keep an eye on the slides. I think I have numbers. If you look down the bottom corner where the Polio Australia symbol is, there is a number. And so um, rather than think, oh, what was the title of that slide? Just jot down the number of the slide and we can go back and have a quick look if need be. Okay, so post-polio exercise. This session, we're going to look at uh, four main areas, benefits of exercise, review and analysis that I was a part of uh, that has been published in the Journal of Rehabilitation Medicine back in 2021, which seemed like a long time ago, but it was only six months, eight months, 10 months. Uh, and then looking at clarifying the overuse weakness, uh, particularly the use of that word and what it actually means. And then a little bit of a um, few slides on information for your health team. Just going to reduce this other window. So before we kind of get into this, I'm going to go through an analogy that I use uh, and I present to the health professionals because exercise is really uh, a limitation of capacity. And everyone has a certain capacity in their body to perform a particular function. Um, but this is an analogy that may be useful for you trying to explain your capacity, your tolerance for exercise and activity to clinicians that you work with uh, on your healthcare team, but even to family and friends, um, it can be useful. Um, so basically, if you think about a, a manual gearbox, and uh, because we're of the older generation, we're probably more familiar with it. I usually ask the question at the, the um, workshops, does anyone still drive a manual vehicle? Only like one hand will ever go up. But everyone has the concept of shifting through gears, a lower gear is a bit slower, but kind of more sturdy, robust, and the fifth gear is kind of free flowing, um, cover longer distances more efficiently. So with that in mind, uh, whether you have a gearbox or not, if you think about our, our gearbox, and this, imagine this, this is your body. So if we had uh, polio, as a child, uh, then we may not have fifth gear accessible. So we wouldn't, if you had five gears on a vehicle, you'd be able to, to drive to the next town, through your city, to the next you know, region, you could travel into state, you could even probably travel across the country um, because you've got all that, that capacity, the full five capacity gears. However, in your car, if you've had polio, you may be missing that fifth gear. And you probably sense that as that I just don't have the same ability or potential um, in my experience of my life. I, I was like missing a gear. Um, and so that's essentially the uh, that's essentially damage from acute polio. And that looks very different across everyone's bodies, um, you know, different levels of paralysis, different levels of, of, of bulb damage. Um, that we all kind of work out what's our stable disability period and we work within our limits. Now we can also lose fourth gear or it may be unreliable depending on kind of what we're asking our body to do. And that can be the undetected damage that we're like, well, I know I had paralysis in my right leg um, and I did my rehab and that kind of faded out and my left leg was good. Well, the reality is that polio doesn't flip a coin and say I'm gonna affect your right or your left. Uh, it affects kind of more globally across muscle groups, but it's subclinical in some areas. And so you may have had long-term um, capacity limitations based on damage that you didn't realize you had, or wasn't really detectable. Even clinically, it wasn't detectable, which is why we kind of call it subclinical. So we wouldn't have fourth gear, maybe it's unreliable. You know, your fourth gear, you put it in there, it doesn't stick, it kind of pops out that kind of feeling that I can't trust it, I can use it, but I, I can't really trust it. So then we move on to, right, if this, we've got three gears left now, 
and we lose one. What is happening when we're losing one? Well, what that is, is the onset after a stable disability, which might have been decades and decades, late effects of polio, post-polio syndrome, that is changes that you detect in your body. Uh, we, we have third gear now under threat. And what we then end up with is that we've got a, a capacity that we're confident using that's only one or two gears. So if you think back to that start there, like when I am thinking about traveling in my vehicle, if I only have one or two gears, I'm not gonna be crossing the country in this vehicle. I'm not going to be driving interstate. I'll probably be limited to driving around my, my um, local area, my town, my suburb. Uh, I'm not gonna get on a freeway with only one or two gears. Um, big long stretches of highway, it's gonna really put stress, strain, wear and tear on those two gears. And the trade-off isn't worth it because I know that the vehicle is going to, to get damaged or be under a lot of strain. And so when you're talking to health uh, practitioners, you can use this analogy and say, look, I've got about one, two or three gears, but if you're asking me to do something that requires a fourth gear or a fifth gear, I'm afraid I can't do that. It's not that I'm belligerent. It's not that I don't want to do it. It's just I recognize the capacity of my body and what it can and cannot do. So that's the analogy. You can also use this in context of um, a respiratory system. So you may have had bulbar damage, um, time in the iron lung, um, difficulty breathing, weakness in the trunk, diaphragm, that kind of thing. From your initial polio, your a clinically undetected damage um, can also be, be there that you wouldn't realize, but you may have something like scoliosis developing, posture changes, weakness in the other respiratory muscles, and the onset of late effects of polio as we lose our the top end and the bottom end of our respiratory volumes. So we can breathe normally in this, this kind of less stress range, but if we have to take an extra breath in or a blow out more, we can kind of lose that. And so in the respiratory system, we can go down to one or two gears. So this isn't just specific to muscles. It's about the system capacity across your body. Now, if you have seen this, um, particular document, book, that we've just made the second edition to. The analogy you just heard uh, is in this book, and I've just basically copied what I wrote in the book and pasted it here on this slide. So we'll give you all these slides after um, this session, we'll send it with a follow-up email. But this is me, that's basically the analogy that I just presented to you, um, goes through the story. And really this is in that book, because this is Introduction to Clinical Practice. So this is designed for a clinical audience, but it's still useful for you to read. And you can read this, um, it's on the Polio Australia, uh, poliohealth.org.au website. It's under the clinical manuals, it's about 44 pages. Uh, we did review it and um, uh, we endorse it, of course, because it's our publication. No, it is, it is uh, up to date with the latest, including 2022 uh, research. So the benefits of exercise, why do we do exercise? What's the point? Well, exercise is medicine, and that's kind of a mantra that um, has been moving through exercise physiology circles for, for a few decades. Um, what does it do? It sustains physiological health, it prevents disease, or at least delays the onset of some disease, uh, helps us preserve function, improves our mental health, and enables social interactions. Um, but when you're a polio survivor, the rules are different. And so we can't think of um, status quo prescription. And the example I usually give is, you know, if someone, uh, uh, a physio, for example, says, oh, here's your exercise. I'm going to give you seven exercises. I want you to do three sets of 10, and then we'll go from there. And you know that capacity is different. You may only have first, second, third gear. So three sets of 10, you already know is a bit much. So unless they're trained or, or understand late effects of polio, um, that's where things get more time intensive for you as a, as a patient because you've got to kind of explain these um, capacity limitations and concepts. Uh, we're trying to work that out with our clinicians uh, Australia-wide, but it is a slow and gradual process. So status quo prescription we need to avoid. It needs to be carefully assessed um, and looking at tolerance 
your response to the exercise that you are prescribed because then we know to titrate it up right no real big changes seems like you dealt with that well we'll add a little bit more or hey that was too much we're going to back it down now an example out of Donval rehab when i was there um earlier this year but it seemed like a long time ago and one of the therapists there said, yeah, I had a polio survivor and we started off with a, a certain prescription of exercise, which I thought was pretty conservative. And a week later, the client came back and said it was too much. And so we bumped it down a bit. And a week later, they came back and said it's too much still. And so that came, that was three weeks kind of gone by. And that's a huge frustration for the clinician and for uh, obviously the clients just make sure that we start low and titrate up. And you'll have a bit of uh, advice to give in terms of what you can do or have been doing and what has worked and what hasn't, and starting low and building up. And that way we can avoid the roller coaster of, of fatigue and pain and function that, that some people do get from their exercise programs. We really want to eliminate that. So that finding a balance uh, between overuse, disuse, safety, and risk in what you are using as an exercise mode, and then kind of maintaining motivation to be able to have a long-term exercise program. And that exercise program is going to look very different for every one of you. One very important thing is that the exercise must be based on muscle charting or manual muscle testing um, for each group. So uh, that's done by a clinician and it's very specific. They're rated on a, a zero to a five level. Um, you know, uh, five is a bodybuilder, <laughs> five is an Olympic weightlifter and five is the, the average 20 year old as well. So it doesn't really tell you in terms of maximum strength, it just says here's the minimum strength is a five to be able to function. Then below that is basically degrees of weakness, uh, which are not linear by any means. So. Why, why, how else is exercise medicine? Well, we have research that shows that judicious exercise can improve many things. And the key word there is judicious. We need to be careful in how we prescribe uh, and what the responses are to exercise. And then benefits appear to occur when activity and exercise are kept within reasonable limits. So we don't want to be fluctuating in what we do in our exercise program. We want to keep it fairly consistent. Now, one thing that we'll do, we do here is um, uh, therapists say, oh, we're going to get you stronger. And, you know, you and I both know that getting stronger is, is really not the big picture here. The big picture is sustaining function for as long as possible um, and sustaining ability to, to, to do the things that give you, you know, quality of life, pleasure, those social interactions, all those, those mental health benefits as well. It's not about trying to keep improving, improving, improving um, to get to a you know, X level of strength. We want it to be effective for all the reasons, not just one reason of being strong. So in general here, what we're, um, let me just check the, uh, no, no one else coming in. Um, three main things here in the research regarding polio survivors' perceptions uh, of quality of life and disability. Three things, one is participation, the other is purpose, and the other is future-oriented coping strategies. Now, there are different activities that take care of these things, but exercise happens to be one of them. If you're participating, you have a higher satisfaction. Um, and then if you have a purpose with your exercise, that also gives you contributes to this future-oriented coping. So we're working on something that is for us, meaningful for the future, uh, and, and some of the times we may be doing it with other people. And one of the things we heard during the pandemic are those people that did rely on, on their um, hydrotherapy or their aquatic uh, therapy was that when those pools shut, it wasn't just that we lost the exercise. It was we lost the exercise, the social interaction, the peer group, that get out of the house, that, that thing that you did uh, that had a purpose. Um, and so keep that in mind that exercise can provide um, those three things. But we also, of course, need to be looking more broadly at how um, we choose our activities and how we, we manage our fatigue and pain and weakness and other symptoms to balance out getting that participation purpose and coping strategies. 
So the review and analysis, this is a little section two, uh, journal of rehab medication, sorry, journal of rehabilitation medicine. And this was a review of about uh, 21 studies we included, just looking at strengthening and cardiovascular intervention. So where a study actually had something that they had polio survivors do, and they measured before and after related to either strengthening or cardiovascular exercise. Uh, and we had this published uh, open access, which means anyone can go on and read the entire um, review. It's a bit long. It's about uh, 18 pages, I think. Uh, that includes references, uh, but we're going to kind of just go over the nuts and bolts of it uh, in the next few minutes. So what were the major findings? Um, remember, with review, we're taking studies that have already been done. We're not actually intervening ourselves. We're looking at what was the effect size, what was the response of people in each of the studies, and then as groups of studies, what's the big picture here? What are we actually seeing? And so a lot, a lot of it's statistical. Um, and a lot of very careful reading, trying to work out um, what fits and what doesn't and the intent. So the effect sizes were modest. So of those interventions and the groups of interventions, it wasn't like a big, huge, positive, wow, that's, that's outstanding effect, but it was modest um, and towards the positive effect. So favoring improvements across a range of contexts. And what that context means is, different types of exercise in different conditions with different prescription. What might be most reassuring is this second thing, which is the strongest effect that we saw was in outcomes within the mental and sensory domain. Now that doesn't really explain what we're talking about, but if you think about pain and fatigue, the domains that we were looked at that measured pain and fatigue, those who were participating in exercise, uh, it had a, the strongest positive effect. So one of the fears that survivors have about participating in exercise is my pain's going to get worse, I'm going to get more fatigued, and what if I get weaker? And those are very valid concerns. This study has just shown, or this review has, has said, look, yes, um, in, in the review we acknowledge those concerns and kind of talk around why those concerns exist, um, but in general, we see this the strongest effect was actually in reducing or controlling um, pain and fatigue. So that's really important for you to, to understand and take in that, that if exercise isn't prescribed carefully and monitored carefully, yeah, you may well have changes and fluctuations in pain, fatigue, and weakness. But if it's done properly, and these studies were you know, highly controlled, if they were done properly, you should have a reduction in those very same things. What other findings did we have? There was a kind of a waning effect slope. So as time went on, the effect, or well, the longer the study, the effect kind of fizzled out a little bit. And there were no real explanations in the literature about that. Um, but we hypothesized that the progressive nature of late effects of polio, post polio syndrome, means that things are gradually going to get worse. But with the exercise, it didn't cause a sudden drop off, uh, which is our biggest concern. Uh, but that gradual change and decrease um, did occur. And that's why we need to be careful with the monitoring side of things. And that polio survivors can be affected by fatigue within the session they're performing, between one session and the next, but also between sessions serially. And so when we say, oh, we need to manage fatigue, we're looking at three things. Is the clinician managing fatigue and checking your response to what you're doing in the moment in the session? Are they making sure that your sessions aren't too close together, like twice a week, three times a week, four times a week, one time a week? Is there enough time to recover so that we're not coming into the next session fatigued? And then in the big picture, looking over weeks and months, are we, are we controlling fatigue or are we on the roller coaster? So that's the kind of level of detail and consideration when we look at fatigue. Uh, two of the main tenets we had here were prescription and exclusion, meaning uh, uh, exercise physiologists, physiotherapists, uh, uh, who are the primary people in Australia who would prescribe exercise are doing very carefully in context of knowing about late effects of polio and that, and that gearbox, that analogy, that functional capacity, and then exclusion. Because if we include muscle groups that are quite weak already, 
then they are not going to improve. And we're going to get to a slide towards the end that helps better explain that. So there's a variety of measures muscle groups strengthened effectively. And the main point here is that strength exercise is suitable for polio survivors. We can't say exactly what type of strength exercise because each of the studies had slightly different parameters and working on different muscle groups um, and in different ways, but strength exercise in general does support um, suitability for polio survivors. And in fact, this, this is a finding that has been found um, uh, in the study of geriatrics for the last 20 or 30 years is that uh, strength isn't something that's reserved for uh, younger age groups. It's something that has impact even as you age. Okay, third section, clarifying weakness, or sorry, clarifying the overuse weakness. So I don't like the word overuse. Uh, and when I was up in Cairns presenting this, there are a few people around the room who said, yeah, I don't like the word either, because um, it doesn't accurately reflect what's happening with, with the weakness that you experience. Um, but we do find beyond capacity more useful. So when we say overuse, that's more oriented to deterioration. Like if I overuse something, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Now, if you've got um, joint degeneration and you are using it over and over again, keeping the same stresses on it chronically, then that is a type of deterioration. A bit like trimming a piece of rope. Once you cut off the piece of rope, the rope gets shorter. I can't get that piece back on. So that's the concept of overuse is that what you had goes away. So if I keep using and doing it, I'll get weak and I'll lose function. Now, that's a concept that we really need to kind of push aside and say, in terms of strength, that's not exactly how it happens or how it works, even in the polio survivor body. Now, beyond capacity is what is more useful. So it's oriented to what you can do, not to overdoing it and the consequences, but like, what can I do? What are my parameters? Where do I sit for this particular activity at this time and this duration, this amount, this volume, this intensity, all those variables that go into exercise. And so think of it more of as adjusting the volume. So if you think about, uh, if you get in the vehicle, your car, and you turn on the radio, do you have to turn the radio from zero, the volume up from zero to a comfortable level or is it already kind of where you left it? In modern cars, it's kind of where you left it. Now, if it's raining or if there's some other external noise, you're gonna fine tune it in that moment on that day. But there's probably a level of volume, it could be the television in your home, that when it comes on, it's at a level that you're fairly comfortable with average time. And that's what we're looking with, at with exercise. We wanna find that sweet spot, that, that, that level of volume that we can certainly adjust based on how we're feeling and, and, and our response to exercise. But there's no need to be bouncing around unnecessarily um, in terms of the parameters beyond the capacity that you know you're familiar with. So if you think about it, uh, playing tennis, on that tennis racket, there's a, there's a sweet spot in there, right? And that sweet spot is where you know, all the pros and good tennis players are going to hit the ball probably 99% of the time in that sweet spot. They don't deliberately try and hit it near the edge of the racket to see what happens. Will this produce a better stroke? No, they know that that is the zone of best performance. And so they forget about strings outside of that zone and they just worry about that zone. So the same concept for you and performing exercise. What is that sweet spot? We don't want to really deviate from that too much. We want to be consistent with our performance and our response to that. So overuse, prefer not to use it. Uh, but beyond capacity um, is, is much more useful. And this is particularly useful to say to clinicians um, because when they hear overuse, just like they'll hear weakness and they think, well, we can rehab weakness. Overuse uh, thinks, makes them think about deterioration and loss of function or loss of, loss of quality of anatomy. But really we're looking at beyond capacity. What is that muscle group, that, that limb, that whole body? How does it respond? Uh, to the known capacity that we have and we're going to work through. So if it's not exercise, then what's going on? Well, there's a few things going on, and this is related to the, the progressive slow deterioration, or the <laughs> progressive slow changes or, or weakening that we may see over time, and that can be in different muscle groups across the body. 
That really comes down to motor unit remodeling. So the alpha motor neurons in the spinal cord that are sending the signal to the muscles, they remodel, they go offline, they come back on, they rebuild. Um, motor unit dropout, which means that those motor units just kind of give up. Uh, that There's a certain percentage of that that is a part of aging, um, but with post-polio, um, it has been shown that those dropouts can be significant in terms of function, particularly with giant motor units. Now, giant motor units are just a, a neuron that has a lot more muscle connected to it. Atrophy and fibrosis, uh, obviously, are factors as well. We have atrophy muscle, or we have fibrosis, which is a change in the quality of the tissue of the muscle. Uh, it doesn't contract as well, and then less of it to contract. Then, yes, we're going to see changes in function and exercise tolerance. Breaching the threshold is that roller coaster. I do too much, I pay the consequences. I do too much, I pay the consequences. Uh, deconditioning where I haven't been exercising or I've stopped doing something that I was doing very consistently uh, and I need to work out, can I do that again? Again, great question for our physios and exercise physiologists. And then of course, aging. Now aging is not at the top of the list here because it shouldn't be. Uh, aging is a part of the experience, but it is not the primary reason why we see these changes in polio survivors with late effects of polio. So our motor neuron profile. So I talked about that scale of the zero to five and anything that's a five could be, you know, your bodybuilders and your Olympic weightlifters and all that kind of thing up to a, a healthy 20 year old. Uh, in fact, well, a healthy 50 year old even uh, is going to have fives where they can resist um, a good force to a muscle group. What's important to know and understand, and this goes back to the capacity as well, is that uh, back in 1961, Beasley did a study of survivors uh, so polio survivors um, uh, who had had muscle gradient testing, uh, but then had passed away. And they look, he looked at an, the anatomy of the muscles and um, compared them to the muscle strength grading that the clinician had given them. And so a five, if you've got at least 50% or half of the muscle fibers in a muscle group operating, you're going to score as a five. So you could have 20% damage or 20% missing, 30, 40% of your muscle fibers not working and still score a five. That's the capacity of the human body. It's quite remarkable. When it comes down to a four, it means you, you can't, you can hold it, but it kind of just kind of gives a bit. You can't really hold that, that contraction. Then that kind of indicates that there's could be about 42% of the muscle fibers working. Now we're going into territory of like, now we're looking at degrees of weakness. So once it bumps down to a three, what Beasley found was that less than 10% of the muscle fibers were actually working in that muscle. So that's like, I've got 10 fingers, I'm gonna play the piano and I only have one, the capacity of one. I can still probably play a melody, but I'm not gonna play some you know, grandiose arrangement. Um, and so when you're, you're going with your clinicians and you're talking about well, how strong am I, if you hear threes, twos, ones, in other words, you're quite weak in a particular muscle group, we're going to automatically exclude that from prescribed exercise. You're just going to use it in function. So use it in your usual activity, but we're not going to prescribe exercise to it. Um, in a lot of cases, there may be some debility that led into it becoming a three. And if so, it's certainly worth trying to see, right, is it going to bump back up? Because it was a five two weeks ago, and now it's a three plus. That's quite a big swing. But if it's something that's been there a long time, then we're not going to add exercise to that um, just because we don't want to overuse it. In other words, we know the capacity is low. We're not going to challenge that capacity incessantly. So beyond that, um, the functional strength there, there's no capacity beyond hypertrophy. And hypertrophy is just uh, a muscle fiber is so big. And then as you strength or you bulk up, the fiber itself, you know, there's thousands and thousands of fibers, gets bigger. Um, there's some trade-offs that we're gonna look at in a slide in a moment. But what's really important to, to relate to here is that it's a similar concept to how clinicians think about blood saturation oxygen in the blood saturation. And if you've got a pulse oximeter or you've been in a hospital, they say, oh, 85%, yeah, you might need some more oxygen or that's getting a bit low. The reason is that after 85% here, 
we drop out of this green zone and into this lower zone here into the red and that this 40 is basically perfusion of oxygen at the, the, the organ level. And if you don't have enough oxygen circulating in the blood, it's not gonna perfuse and your organs are gonna be operating at the threshold. But what I want you to think about here is like, we're good, we're good, we're good. And then it drops off quickly. Same here, we're good at high fives, you know, down to a four. And then from a four, it drops down really quickly to 10%. So it's like this little ledge uh, of strength and the same concept in general that we have in the fours and fives, we'd be in the green here, but anything below a four or five is going to drop into the red. So this is what we wouldn't exercise. Again, a similar analogy. And if you, you say to a clinician, it's like my, my weakness is like um, blood oxygen saturation. If I'm a four or a five, we can work with that. That's good. But if it's less than a four, we shouldn't really be stressing it. Okay. All right, uh, on to hypertrophy. On the left-hand side here is normal hypertrophy. So, sorry, normal, um, which is, there's a range of normal, of course, but in terms of muscle fiber size. Now, the little red dot is a capillary. And so diffusion is how muscle fibers get nutrients and get rid of, you know, metabolic waste back into the bloodstream to return to the heart, get reoxygenated and that kind of thing. If we are working a muscle really hard over the long term or just deliberately, we're trying to build muscle, then these muscle fibers, you can see, went from a moderate size to a large fiber. And that's great. Uh, it does provide us with, with strength for function, but it means this diffusion distance, it doesn't change just because the hypertrophy changes. There can be more capillaries, but it doesn't mean that the diffusion is going to be as close to every single muscle fiber. Um, and now this is consequential in terms of how we, we consider pain with exercise and tolerance of exercise. And if we're not getting enough nutrients and interchange in, in um, metabolites within the muscle, it's going to protest a bit. If you are relying on this long term, and polysurvivors have had significant paralysis, would have this presentation for decades and decades. But let's say you have a fall, you go into have a flu or something, or you go into hospital, and over a week or two, you're going to be drifting back towards this normal size, which may be normal, but it's not sufficient for you to function with that muscle group. And so that's the short-term change where we can see, right, a week or two ago, I was good. It may be this... Um, uh, scenario playing out across muscle groups. Information for the health team. You will have to speak to exercise. This is what I tell the clinicians, whether it's GPs or nurses or, or, or exercise physiologists or occupational therapists. I say, look, poly survivors are probably going to ask you about activity and exercise. Should I do this? What should I do? What shouldn't I do? Those kind of questions. Um, is it okay for me to ride a bike? Is it okay for me to use a treadmill? All those questions, we find you don't generally reserve them for physios or exercise physiologists, but you're going to inquire across like any healthcare person. So you can see that here we ask survivors of these four risk areas, uh, what do you expect your therapist to know? So most of them uh, had one of the options was uh, activity and exercise. So we'd expect you know, physios, occupational therapists, exercise therapists to, to know about activity and exercise. The second biggest choice was falling, the risk of falling. What was interesting is that when we came over to nursing, what GPs, ex activity and exercise still rank the highest. So about a quarter, so about um, a quarter of the actual responses were based on activity and exercise being something that they would ask their GP or the nurse they were working with. Now this QR code here goes to a single page um, document that we have that's built for GPs, but it's useful for yourself um, to guide you on exercise, but also for your um, uh, clinicians to look at as well. The top part of that sheet is shown right here. And things here we've already kind of covered in this session in terms of what needs to be prescribed and monitored. You need someone who knows what they're doing, we need to avoid the roller coasters. We think, you know, slow, conservative, aim low, titrate up, look at the safety features. 
And then thinking about late effects of polio weakness can be stabilized or slowed, but never normalized. And so when someone says, get stronger, that's not why you're there. You're there. I mean, you are there to get stronger, but not in the sense of, I want to get strong. Um, gee, that's a bit, <laughs> that's a bit um, oblique. Um, but stabilized function is what we're actually after. We don't want to lose or get more weak because that's going to put us at the threshold of function. Uh, and then avoiding unnecessary extra stress and then educating you on moderate, consistent exercise and risks of disuse. That's exactly what this session is covering. So those unaffected muscle groups, uh, another consideration that I've already touched on, which is there may be on my good side, I may have my, my worst side or my, my most polio affected side or the side with several um, muscles with the level of paralysis, but on the good side, which seems to be okay, it's when this changes that we get reports about, right, I'm concerned now, this late effects of polio or post polio syndrome, my good side's worsening, what am I going to rely on? So your good side, even as a 20 year old, after having had polio, you may have this profile, you may have 70, 80, 65, 55 strength in the good side. And then that's stable, I mean, it's above that 50%. So we know we're going to score as a five on muscle testing, but this is all subclinical. A clinician is not going to detect that. What happens with that, you know, one to two percent change per year uh, and a little bit of normal aging thrown in is that we hit these thresholds where it breaks that 50 percent. We're back into the 40s. So this is about a four, a four. This is below a four, maybe a three plus. And these are getting less strong or weakening. So what happens is here is that you lose confidence in the good side. And so I'm not talking about change on the bad side here, I'm talking about that relied upon side. The main point here is don't think about your good side as unaffected. Polio, like I said, doesn't flip a coin and choose left or right, it's scattered muscle damage. In certain areas, it's gonna be more um, distinct to you historically and currently but there is subclinical damage there. Another concept um, that's worth um, pointing out here is in terms of strength and cardiovascular and uh, risk of symptoms worsening, you're in a period of stable disability. This is the column on the left here. And that can be 15 to 35 to 45, 50 years before things start to change. And so you might've had an exercise program that worked long-term, and that worked for you and um, you, could, you could rely on it and perform it, great. And then things change with late effects of polio. So that where, is where things you were doing previously may not be tolerated and that may deter you from doing the same again or participating. And that's something we really want to recognize is that if things get difficult, it doesn't mean stop, it means get it reassessed. So routine exercise may not be tolerated and we don't know what's going to happen here. So we have to really back off and see what the rate of change is. What are your clinicians saying? What do they think? How are they testing this out? Are they keeping it monitored well? And then afterwards, you're like, okay, things seem to have stabilized. We found a new sweet spot on the racket. Maybe that sweet spot was big and that sweet spot has shrunk. We just need to work within the parameters of that sweet spot again. Um, but it means changes in the actual design um, and monitoring of our exercise programs. Remember, you'll get all these slides. So here we are at about quarter to the hour. Um, topics there, benefits of exercise, review and analysis. We covered clarifying overuse and then information for your health team. You will get all these slides. We'll send it to you in the follow-up. Um, and my contact details are there.